Hello and uh, welcome to the third of our series of short films. Uh, my name is Luke Walden. I'm a film producer and it's my pleasure to be interviewing Michael Peppard, who's a professor, historian and author uh, of the world's oldest church and poet artist Roger Wagner, who has written seven songs from Isios. And if uh, you haven't heard of Isios, uh, you're about to find out because we're in Duro Europus in Syria. Uh, we're near uh, the, the border of the ancient Roman Empire and we're in the world's oldest church. And I want to ask you, Michael, uh, a little about Isios and his baptism. Tell us about him and his baptism. Uh, absolutely. But before I do that, I need to say one quick word about my mother and it will connect. And here, here's here's how this connects. <laughs> Um, this was my second book, World's Oldest Church, and my first book was based on my dissertation. Uh, it's called The Son of God in the Roman World and was a little bit little bit more dense. And uh, with my second book, I wanted to write a book that my mother would actually read and would finish. And <laughs> like that. As, and as I'm thinking about how to do this, and, and I know what my topic is, I know I'm going to write about Dura and try to write a, a, a reevaluation of the Dura evidence, I, I realized... I need a little bit more narrative. I need a little bit of story uh, to 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 for a reader who is not already interested, right? And I'm thinking, how do I do this without being hokey or and still having my colleagues respect me? And how do I how do I use narrative to advance argument? And as I'm pondering that question over a number of months, I find this this uh, graffito. This these there's graffiti, you know, all over the archaeological site. Um, you know, a graffito on an amphora on a on a on a on a piece of pottery that says "Isi uh, Neophytos," and Neophytos is a, a misspelling or a variant spelling of the Greek word neophyte, uh, which in, originally in Greek means newly planted, but has come to be a kind of technical term for an, an early Christian initiate, possibly based on some psalms uh, which referred to. Um, a collection of new children, like new plants yeah. around a table, um, which is possibly where they're getting this word. But it's not too hard to imagine where the idea of a new plant comes from as, right. a, as, a, as a new Christian. And then I spent months trying to figure out if anyone else in the ancient Mediterranean was using the word neophyte. Hmm. Because if, if, any, if I could find anyone else, then I couldn't be sure this is a Christian, right? And I couldn't. People use, people, modern scholars use neophyte as a way to refer to someone in the past, but they themselves, as far as I can tell, no one else is using this term. So I went, I went with it and I said, okay, I've got someone. I have, a, I have a real person with whom I can imagine the space, with whom I can imagine what it was like to be, to be a convert um, uh, in this baptistry, in this space of initiation. So that's how I came to, to him. It's possibly a form of the name Jesse, but but it could, it's really just one, one consonant and one vowel or two vowels. So there's not, it could be a lot of different names. Um, so we don't know much else uh, about him, except that he's a neophyte, which likely means, I think almost certainly means that he was an early Christian initiated at Dura. And I mean, what, sorry, Roger. What, what, no, sorry, Rob, when I, what, because I mean, you talk quite a lot, don't you, about the the actual um, what baptism would be like. Um, yes. um, for, so maybe it'd be just good to hear about that before I read the poem. Because uh, absolutely, <laughs> uh, absolutely. So we, um, when we're reconstructing early Christian initiation sites and early Christian initiation um, programs, we have to use some uh, historical imagination and some kind of filling in to connect the dots because most of our evidence about what early Christians were doing in initiation is later than Dura. Dura is very, very early. We know that baptism was happening uh, from the beginning, uh, obviously from John the Baptist and on as a rite of kind of a one-time conversion experience that involved repentance, that involved joining of a new community, um, that involved a fundamental reorientation of one's life and likely involved moral teachings and, and new moral commitments as well. But as for what else they're doing besides dunking people in water, there is an awful lot of guesswork that has to happen. So 
Um, we use texts from the third century Syria, from fourth century and fifth century to try to imagine what else is going on. It is likely that there are some psalms involved, a recitation of psalms. Um, it's likely that there is anointing uh, with oil, which makes sense when you remember that the word Christos or Christ or Messiah, Mashiach, all mean anointed ones. So for someone to, to join a Christian community, to imitate and follow Christ, it makes sense that to be anointed with oil is a way to uh, to imagine that. Anointing was also very uh, widely used for healing, and we have uh, healing associations uh, with early Christian initiation, uh, protection from uh, you know from illness, protection from evil um, is is a part of that as well. So the combination of anointing and water immersion and psalms. Um, then lead probably, I would say at Dura, almost certainly lead to a meal, which concludes that event. And if we imagine the procession through that building to the assembly hall, uh, likely there was then a communal meal. That was the, the kind of the first celebration of their, their meal with the community. That is absolutely fascinating. And it sort of brings alive that community in a way that I just, I, 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 I've sat here transfixed. Roger, you've written your second poem. Do you want to read that for us? Yeah. Um, so, um, I mean, one of the actual things that Michael suggests, which I think is is, is that actually that that um, amphora that the um, that the name was on might have even have been the amphora that was poured over whether the water was poured over is here. So I sort of go with that, and um, uh, also you know thinking about about the river of the um, the Euphrates. So, uh, so I. Um, uh, I wrote it almost as a kind of a limerick. It goes like this. The rivers that have flowed over my head, the great waves that have drowned my pride and youth, have dragged fear from my side, have washed my heart of pride, and brought me old and dripping to the truth. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That's, that's, that's also very beautiful. And uh, I, I, I can almost see him dripping at the dinner table, um, having gone through this process. That's fantastic. Um, Michael, tell us a bit about the shepherd fresco and the other members of the church, because this is this is such a fascinating building, this ancient church, the world's oldest church. Um, but tell us a, a little bit about describe the shepherd fresco for us, would you? And then tell us about members of the church. Sure. So the the um, the centerpiece of the room is a uh, artistically is a fresco with uh, a shepherd with uh, a sheep or ram over the shoulders, and then a flock of sheep below that are uh, uh, both seem to be both eating and drinking uh, from from a river and grass below. And then there's also an, a little inset uh, Adam and Eve image, uh, which may or may not be part of the original artistic program. There's uh, not consensus about that. But sticking just with the shepherd and, and the sheep, the shepherd and the flock for now, uh, when I teach my course on early Christian art, um, we start with the image of sheep and shepherd because it is simply ubiquitous. So to assign only one meaning to this would be foolish uh, because there it's every, it's in the catacombs, it's on, it's on book covers, it's in sermons, it's, it's truly everywhere. But when you look at the biblical record, this makes sense too. We have shepherd and sheep imagery with Moses. We have shepherd and sheep imagery with uh, Ezekiel. Of course, the Psalms, the Lord is my shepherd, um, but also Psalm 151, which is in um, not in the Western canon of Psalms, but is in the Eastern canon of Psalms, is a is a psalm about David uh, as a shepherd and his calling and his his anointing. Um, and then we get into uh, the New Testament and the Gospels, and we have parables of the lost sheep as an image of salvation. We have I am the good shepherd in the Gospel of John. Should I stop? We could keep going honestly with these things. Um, so it's ubiquitous, but. Robin, Robin Jensen, who's a great historian of early Christian art and early Christian initiation, she uh, she in her uh, work, Baptismal Imagery in Early Christianity, what she ultimately says is, look, this is primarily a, a motif of incorporation into a community. So it, it, it could be a lot of other things, but if we have to pick one meaning for this, that's the best meaning, and I think she's right. And we also can see that through the, the imagery of 
what they call the seal or the the brand, uh, Greek Sphragis uh, Syriac Krushma, which is uh, yes, if you're you're owning an animal and you put you know you put your stamp or brand on that animal. So there, um, the metaphor in both Greek and Syriac is car- is carrying with it um, a meaning that helps us to understand what they're doing. That when you join this community you are taking on the name of the founder of of Christ you are taking on the identity of the founder you are you are claimed right and so that helps me understand why there are so many sheep in this in this image and it's not just the one shepherd like we mm-hmm. often see in the catacombs or one shepherd with a couple below but i think there are 17 or something like that i've tried to figure out a meaning for the number and i can't but, but i think it's just an image of a lot of sheep to say that ah. you're you're joining a vibrant community that's how right. i interpret it right but that, that's probably safer N- n- numbers and biblical numbers is uh that, that that's that's a very shady path to di- dive down isn't it <laughs> can get yeah. lost in all sorts of numerics but but I, I like that image and i also love the idea that you're introducing there really of 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 belonging and ownership that that the sheep belong to one another as a community but they're also belonging to the shepherd there's this there's that's a very rich image in that but tell us a little bit about the people who we think belong to the shepherd in this community Philetus I think and Hera and Paulus uh, who, who are the people that we yeah. we would see there well, so as I said with uh, Isios, I was I was on the hunt for names. I was on the hunt for some real people that I could think with and sit with and try to imagine imagine this space with. Uh, so they came through. These people came through different uh, through different modes. We have uh, you know the name Proclus, which is inscribed over the the fresco of David and Goliath, who is likely the uh, the dedicant, or perhaps he contributed some money um, for for the outfitting of this baptistry and the reconfiguration of it. We have the name Sisios, which comes in a graffito uh, outside of the baptistry wall. We have the name Philetus, which comes uh, on a a graffito that was found elsewhere in the city of Dura. Um, But I associate that and and a couple others, maybe the three other people who have ever cared about that (laughs) have, have, have said, well, it, it says Philetus with a P-R, a pyro, and the pyro um, are shaped uh, looking like a kind of uh, head on top of a body. And P-R from other early Christian graffiti means presbyter or elder or leader, what later becomes the word priest. And so uh, I, I think, well, this is uh, this is enough to go on. We know uh, We know that we have a Christian community here and this makes sense. So so if you're looking for me to fill out the details of their lives, unfortunately, Luke, I cannot. What I can say is that we we know the names and we know that there are women's names too. The name Hera was recorded um, as a graffito uh, in the baptistry by, by the excavators. It's no longer visible, but they recorded it as there. So we have... We have a mix of men's names, uh, one woman's name. We have some names found in the military records of the town, Paulus and Proclus, good good Latin names. And so we can kind of start to get a prosopography or a sense of the composition of the community that makes it feel more real to the readers. And that uh, that's interesting, too, because it's, it's, it, you're describing quite a mixed community there in I seem to remember, if we go back to the first of these uh, little films, this this is a, a town by our standards of a few thousand people. So, and yet it's not it's not uh, it's not a, a a very homogenous group in the sense that they're all the same. This is quite a varied group. There seem to be people from different roles in life. Uh, it certainly could be, and uh, so let's also remember that from what we know about early Christian conversion, that uh, sometimes entire households convert. Right. So it's. Right. Um, all the in the book of Acts, we see this uh, frequently. So and so, and their oikos, uh, and their household, right? Yes. So that that could account for uh, for some of that mixedness. Um, but also, as I said in in an earlier video, setting this up, Dura Europos was a crossroads of antiquity that included all kinds of people. So it is likely that many of the early Christians there had some connection to the military. Um, but it's also possible that some did not and were living there in service industries to the military. That's fantastic. Well, I'm going to come again to Roger to to round us out with another of our your poems. I, I think you're going to read the fourth poem in the book, aren't you? Yeah. So when I was there in 1998, we one of the 
well, actually both times, what on that little road um, going through all the Bedouin villages, what one noticed again and again were the little boys who were the shepherds <laughs> with, with a sort of flock of, you know, 10 or so sheep who would follow them around um, and they would be leading them, you know, to the, the pastures and uh, particularly one uh, on the way to uh, where to Aleppo, we saw one one little um, group, a uh, 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 shepherd, who had led his sheep across the um, a motorway to the central reservation, where where, where the best the um, best the greenery was, and so um, so this poem was kind of um, a mixture of that. It was. Um, Michael talks, I think, um, of a Manichaean psalm book, so I, um, um, which he, he parallels to. Um, uh, you, well, you have to read the book to discover what he says about it. But, but I imagine a, a Dura Europos um, psalm book, uh, which these names uh, of, that Michael was talking about appear in, um, and uh, and I kind of mix that with the um, with the, the sheep on the motorway. Um, so, here's here's the poem from the Dura Europos psalm book. We are the sheep of his pasture and the flock of his hand, and we lack nothing. We have eaten the bread of life. We have drunk the water of life, and we lack nothing. And I, Hera, am counted among the virgins in whose torches oil was found and lack nothing. And I, the humble Sisios, am counted among those whose names are remembered in heaven and lack nothing. And I, Paulus, have received grace upon grace and lack nothing. We have followed your voice and crossed over from death to life we shall not want. Though chariots of iron thunder on either side, they shall not come near us. Though deadly fumes compass us round, they shall not come nigh our dwelling. At the centre of all, he makes us lie down on green grass. We shall not want. And I, Proclus, a soldier of Christ, have been clothed with his armour and lack nothing. And I, Philetos, the presbyter, have been found faithful and lack nothing. And I, Isios, the new planted, have been planted by some streams of living water and lack nothing. The Lord will guard his little flock and no one will snatch us from his hand. Though everything we have is taken away, we shall not want. Though everything we have is taken away, we lack nothing. <laughs>